Welcome everyone. My name is Jamie Nemsis and welcome to the Market Thinkers Series 3. This series being dedicated to retirement. As per usual, I'm joined by my business partner and my co-host, Drew Meredith. Welcome, Drew. Thanks, Jamie. And our guest today is Nick Langley uh, from Clearbridge Investments. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, as most of you know, Drew and I run a wealth management business in Melbourne called Waddle Partners. And our, what we specialize in is retirement. So most of our clients are plus 60. Most of our clients are high net worth clients. And uh, essentially, we look after them in the last third of their life. This, uh, this series being dedicated to retirement is really close to what we do every day. One of the things or one of the tools that we give our clients to, to manage expectations about investments and portfolios is a simple formula. And that formula being TR equals I plus G. So total return always equals income plus growth. Within our portfolios, um, infrastructure plays a big role. And today's uh, episode is dedicated to infrastructure that essentially helps with both that I and the G. Uh, Drew, would you like to introduce Nick more formally and uh, also talk about what the session will cover? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, I think provide a bit of a, some, some flavour around, around what we're talking about. In the last few episodes, we've probably focused on two big themes and I think infrastructure fits both of them perfectly. One is income. You know, we saw so many Australian companies cut their dividends by 40 or 50% last year. So when you're in retirement, having that diversity and resilient income, which doesn't come from you know, diversifying into four banks, it comes from diversifying into multiple assets, multiple countries uh, and, and those sort of ideas, but also the institutional grade type of assets. So we're, we've spoken a lot about finding assets that... Um, that are high quality have uh, been you know, relied on by institutional investors for multiple years and, and there's reasons why they do that. So we're hoping to kind of uncover a few of those during this session um, and welcoming Nick who co-founded Clearbridge back in 2006 after spending a lot of, a lot of time on the, on the sell side research, research side in global infrastructure. We've called quite a few people lifers um, in this series where can we call you an infrastructure lifer as well? Yep, yeah, pretty much, mate. A yeah. number of different roles, but uh, certainly all of my adult life. Excellent. And uh, so Clearbridge is part of Franklin Templeton, which has about 1.5 trillion, and now Clearbridge is up to is it about 200 billion. Um, formerly rare infrastructure, wasn't it? Is that right, Nick? The, about, is that that's for the so. So Clearbridge, uh, Clearbridge is, is part of Franklin Templeton. Has got uh, a lot of US equities and and, oh, okay, yeah. and what we've done is we've taken rare infrastructure and slotted that in and become the the infrastructure component of uh, of Clearbridge. So I'd like to say that we have two hundred billion under management. We don't. We're uh, we're about nine billion Aussie dollars. Still amazing though. Your your journey over the last uh, fifteen years has been a credit to you and your team. It's uh, nine billion dollars of infrastructure money. Back then, it would have been nearly a new asset class. It, it pretty much was. You know, when we started, we had the idea to get get kickstarted in the space late two thousand five. Um, Richard Elmsley and myself we got together with what was then Treasury Group, yep. um, and and you know formed Rare Infrastructure. Uh, and and got you know started on a, on a wing and a prayer basically. Uh, we managed to get to uh, break even just before the GFC, so that was a bit of a nerve wracking time. Through a month. Uh, through, <laughs> through all of that. But you know, interestingly, post GFC, people said, "Okay, you know, I need to find somewhere that's got relatively safe from a capital value perspective, that that you know G mm. perspective, mm. And, and pays me some income." Yep. And hey, you know what? Infrastructure fits that bill. And so, you know, we really grew a lot post uh, post GFC, and over the, over the last decade, and in, in particular. And how did you get into infrastructure? This is almost backstory, isn't it? How did you get into yep. infrastructure initially? Was it you liked toll roads and and airports, or was yeah. it I, went over? I, like like a lot of these things, you kind of fall into them by accident. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was I was investment banking here in in uh, in Sydney, more on the transactional M and A side, uh, and and you know Australia was going through a phenomenal privatisation process across 
you know, across the utilities, obviously out of Victoria, Southern Australia, there was a lot of toll roads being built. You know, it's where Transurban started being pulled together. And, and so, you know, we were, we were acting for and advising a lot of uh, big corporates and pension plans and others who were looking at, uh, at these deals. I then went off and spent a few years in, in New York to kind of round out the, the understanding of banks and so on. And then came back here in the early 2000s and worked for AMP Capital mm. in their infrastructure funds management group and in in unlisted infrastructure and uh, was a principal in their business. And ultimately, uh, we created Duet Group and, and listed that on the exchange in, in Australia. It's about $5 billion worth mm. of assets. And I was the CFO. Of the of the entity, and then eventually stepped out of that. So, yeah, you know, kind of went on the on the uh, sell side, if you will, advising clients, and then moved, you know, on to being a, a principal, actually, you know, taking taking risk on our, our own behalf at AMP, and then and then stepping out and, and creating Rare on the back of a recognition that there is a significant amount of capital chasing deals in the unlisted market, a little bit like, like it is today. Um, but there was, you know, very very few people looking at the at the listed infrastructure market, and out of that, you can actually put together overnight a portfolio of thirty or forty companies, you know, across all of those core infrastructure sectors, and you could then package that up into a fund that allowed retail investors and you know some larger institutions as well. They're about forty percent of our, our asset base. Uh, allowed those investors to participate in the long-term you know, risk return proposition of infrastructure because you know, ultimately you're investing in the same underlying assets, you've yeah. got the same regulators providing the same regulated returns. It's sure. just a question of whether you hold that in the listed market and you've got upside of liquidity, okay, downside of some equity market volatility, sure. or you hold that in the unlisted market where you've got kind of those direct asset exposures. And when you see, when you put your... Uh, Nick Langley lens on and you you look at these vehicles, do you see the vehicles or do you see the underlying assets? Mate, we are all about the underlying assets. Yeah, okay. So the whole premise of what we do is we take the valuation approach, the long-term financial models and everything else that we did in the unlisted world yep. and we apply that to the listed world. So we essentially, and you, know, you see this in our financial models, we look through the holding company and we say, okay, what are the underlying assets and what are the prospects for those assets in terms of you know growth in the in the asset base mm-hmm. and the returns that the regulators are going to allow these companies to earn and, yep. and that gives us a valuation of those underlying assets and you know we back that into uh, a security price valuation does it does it require a really unique skill set and your level of experience to, to do global infra you know everyone picks up and measures a pe on a, on a you know, normal stock how and, and there's so many mispricings between different types of assets it it does you know this it's really weird this there's not many uh people on the buy side that have a, a good understanding of valuing long dated assets you know most of it you're right is is you know, general equities, they're all about the shorter term. What's the earnings going to do? What's my PE? You know, think about some sort of, you know, DDM or some sort of, you know, compound yeah. growth model at the at the end of it for a terminal value. And that terminal value might be, you know, five years out. Well, you know, we're building 30 and 40 year financial models, which look at the growth in assets over time. And listen, every time one of our water companies goes to their regulator in the UK, they mm-hmm. file a 25 year capital expenditure plan. And, and so, you know, you've actually got great information. Sure. What that allows you to do is to come up with quite stable valuations for your for your underlying assets and therefore your companies, and you allow the market to kind of trade around it. And, and the more stable your valuations, the better the buy-sell signals that come through in your investment process. So under your value buying and over your value thinking about selling. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah. And, and we add, you know, a risk component to that as well. So every investment that we have in the portfolio has a hurdle rate return. The more risky the investment, the higher the hurdle rate, because I want to make sure that my clients are being compensated for the risk that's sitting inside of their portfolios. And what is it? Some you right, go, Drew. I was going to say, what's what does that turnover kind of look like? What's your universe? Is about three hundred stocks investable, or 
yeah, big broad universe, about about three hundred. A lot of that's emerging markets, so we, we trim out, you know, some of the some of the, the the tails on either side. And so you're looking at about two hundred companies that you know we consider core infrastructure. Um, we have around thirty five in the portfolio at any given time, and we turn over you know generally around a third of the portfolio each year. Um, although you know, that's different names, the same names. No, that's a good question. So a third by value. Uh, but by names, about 25%, about a quarter. And that's because, you know, as, as the market moves up and down, we will trim these and, you know, top them up and so on. And how many have forced kind of exits like uh, Sydney Airport at the moment? Mate, it's been unbelievable, <laughs> hasn't it? You know, in, in, in Australia, you know, we've been saying for 10 years, oh, all these companies are going to go private at some stage. And then it all happens within the same quarter. So, you know, Sydney Airport, Osnet and, and Spark Infrastructure, um, all looking like they're going to go. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Listen, it is, w- what's going on here is the big institutions have recognised that we've got a 20-year tailwind in infrastructure and, and you know, some of that's decarbonisation, some of that's fighting climate change, some of that's, you know, we need inflation-linked uh, assets in our, in our sure. portfolios. And they're saying... Income. We need, to, we need to increase our allocations. And mm. particularly in Australia, and the reason a lot of it's happened here, is you know, the pension funds, their, their flows are going up, their inflows are going up. And so, and so they're looking at all of this cash coming in saying, I've got to buy some of these assets that are going to protect my portfolio, be ballast in my portfolio and provide me with some income over the longer term. And, and just the sheer yeah. size of them, right? They're, they're you know, $200 billion funds. So you can't go out and buy a, you know, fifty million dollar bridge. You've got to buy something that's significant to be able to, you know, move the dial. Yeah, so. yeah. You got to go big. And why are they? Why are they willing to pay so much more than the market? <laughs> Seems like all the time. Is that just well, misunderstanding, or so a good question, Drew. So no, it's a, it is a great question, right? Because because you know, financial theory <laughs> tells you that if you're going to lock up your money for a period of time then you should get a higher return. Mm. And therefore, you should be buying these things at a discount. Mm. But, but actually, they're buying these things at a premium. Mm. right? When you look at uh, the deals that have been done in the private sector, the 10 largest deals um, in, you know, in, the last, in the last few years, uh, it's, it's been done at, a, at an earnings multiple, EBITDA, which is like cash earnings multiple, just under 18 times. Right? And in the listed market, we trade at about 12 times. And so you've got a massive premium that's going through. So there's a couple of things going on. One, there's a premium for control, right? Because in the listed market, we're always a minority holder. Uh, So these guys are controlling the underlying assets. Two, you know, arguably they can get some synergies. They can do some development. They can run, very importantly, they can run higher leverage ratios than the listed market will tolerate. And and so that that adds a bit to it as well. And, and the final thing, which which I think is is underappreciated, is if you're in the unlisted space, you become a mark to model valuation, right? Because you know essentially what they do is they run the same financial models that we do. Mm. They put in a you know low cost of capital, and and that gives you a, a high valuation. Whereas in the listed market. You know, you, you've always got this equity market volatility. You're mark to market on a daily basis. There's noise in the market around inflation, around GDP, around you know, bond yields and things like that. And so they naturally trade at a, at a lower multiple. Um, so listen, the same underlying assets, same regulators, same, same return profiles. It's just in the listed market. We can actually buy those things more cheaply. And we've got more confidence in the, in the capital value uh, and we've got that income coming through um, year in, year out. Is there a, when, when they buy these infrastructure assets off um, off an exchange, do they get rid of a level of management fees as well? They do. They do. You're right. So, you know, they can uh, they can generally cut back on some of the management team. Yep. Uh, they can cut back on some of the costs around, you know, exchange uh, and, and, you know, issues with... Um, uh, investor relations and, and things like that. So there are some savings, um, not massive, uh, but there there are some some savings at the margin. 
you hinted on kind of inflation there and do, you know depending on what day you read the paper inflation's bad for infrastructure because there's so much debt or it's great for infrastructure because you have to increase your you get you know higher replacement costs yep. yeah um, yield yep. which which way is it <laughs> is it so, good or bad is it so the short answer is inflation is good for infrastructure yeah mm. right so so our valuations are positively correlated to infrastructure uh, you know, if you're looking across most infrastructure assets, you know, a 1% increase in inflation, you know, for say a 10 or 15 year period is going to lead to you know, generally five or 6% increase in the, in the value of those underlying assets. Um, and, and so, you know, that's obviously a good thing. Uh, but the, the point that I would make is whether it's inflation or bond yields or, or GDP, Generally, these are adjusted for as the companies go through regulatory resets. And, you know, in the utility space, that's generally every five years. Um, in the US, they do it on a shorter basis. It's one, two or three years. Um, and, and so as they go through those regulatory resets, the regulators change the returns they will let the companies earn. Uh, and, and those returns are generally linked to like a CAPM model. So it's a, it's a basic, you know, Financial, everybody understands how to calculate it. It's pretty you know, fair. Uh, they're, they're attractive returns in the US right now. Okay, bond yields, call them one and a half percent, but maybe they should be between two and two and a half. These guys are earning a return on the equity in their asset base yep. of around 10%, right? Nine to 10%. Um, so it's pretty attractive return relative to, let's call it the risk-free uh, bond yields. Yep. Uh, and the other thing that's important is you know, as your asset base increases, you know, assuming you're, you're earning a relatively steady return, which they have been for a while, then your earnings are going to increase, your cash flows are going to increase, and your dividends are going to increase. And so we've had a nice, you know, growth in dividends coming out of the, um, the funds over a long period of time as well. You're also refinancing debt at a lower rate too, aren't you? Everyone worries about bond yields, but if you're borrowing cheaper and on a longer term basis... Your earnings are still strong. Fixed or flow? How, how does your debt? What, what kind of debt do you carry in your fund? Nick? Right. So, so there's no debt at the at the fund level itself. Okay. So, yep. so we look down to the the underlying companies. Yep. Um, if you're a utility company, then your debt costs are actually a pass through. Right. So, so the regulator is about rewarding the equity players and separately rewarding the debt. Uh, debt holders and, and, and the like. So, so interestingly, you know, if rates were to go up and our cost of debt goes up, then that's accounted for separately and that's not affecting our return as, mm -hmm. uh, as equity holders, which is, which is good news. Right? There's some short-term fluctuations, but over the medium and longer term, we're, we're all good in that respect. Yep. And if you're, a say, a transurban, uh, then it's a, it's a little different, right? Because you've got uh, very long-duration assets, uh, your, uh, your tolls are on a fixed kind of path. They increase by inflation, the greater of inflation or, or you know, 1% a quarter. Uh, and so, you know, if bond yields go up, then actually that does affect the, uh, the likes of, of, uh, of Transurban and, and their valuation. However, there's, a, there's an interesting part to it. So if bond yields go up because inflation's going up, then they get that back in their tolls, mm. right? If bond yields are going up because the economy is getting better and therefore mm. real yields are going up, yep. then they're going to get more traffic on their on their toll roads and their networks. There's going to be more trucks moving goods around. Um, and so as a result, their revenues go up in, in that respect. So, you know, it's it becomes it becomes quite an interesting game. It's quite asset specific. Uh, so one of the things that we do is a lot of analysis on each individual company before it makes it into the portfolio. And we're obviously thinking about how that uh, macro environment will, will develop over time. And how's that asset base change? So a quick summary on the types of assets you're buying and has it evolved in your 15 years or more That's than 15, year, 20 years? Yeah. So, so you know, the, the universe that we look at, uh, you know, is a little over three trillion dollars of of equity market capitalization. Um, you know, and that's about six trillion dollars of, of assets. Uh, you know, and put it in in perspective, all the all the unlisted deals that have been done, and obviously there's some big ones like Sydney Airport, but all the unlisted deals that have been done in the last ten years is a little over a trillion dollars worth of assets. 
So, you know, the listed markets are quite a lot larger. Uh, what we find is we lose about five or six companies a year um, to, you know, takeovers, whether they be listed on listed or public to privates and things like that. Um, but we've got a lot of new companies coming in. Now, we're quite specific about what we call infrastructure. You know, we want um, poles and wires and pipes in, in the utility space. Yep. And then on the infra side, you know, it's a move involved in moving people or goods around the economy, roads, rail, ports, airports. And then we add in some communications. We won't touch anything that's kind of social infrastructure related. We don't touch anything that's got you know, pure commodity price exposure or power price exposure. And so you know, what we found is our universe has steadily increased um, in value as these companies have been uh, investing in and growing their asset bases over time. So digital, your communications like digital, you're doing 5G towers or, or 4G Whichever, whichever ones are rolling out at the moment. <laughs> so, so we do we do the towers companies. Yep. Um, we have a couple of satellite companies in the in the portfolio. You know, traditionally they've launched satellites uh, which have a fifteen year life, and they'll mm. pre-sell most of that capacity. And so you've got you know ten to twelve years of visibility of, of, of to their cash flows. Mm. Um, where we draw the line at the moment is data centers. So most of the data centers have their clients on rolling one to three year contracts. And, and you know, our view is at the moment, we can't call those infrastructure. They're, yeah. they're, they're much more like property. It's kind of a leasing game. Mm. I was going to sneak back to inflation. So you benchmarked against an inflation index. Are you we nervous? Are. are you nervous? <laughs> is no. it US inflation? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not nervous for, for benchmark <laughs> reasons. <laughs> I'm nervous for a whole bunch of other reasons. Um, so so let's, let's unpack that a little. So our benchmark is G7 inflation uh, plus five and a half after yep. fees. And so what we're trying to deliver our clients is five and a half percent real annualized over rolling five-year periods. And, you know, that's, that's about the margin that regulators are comfortable for the companies to, to earn. Right, and that's and that's where the where the benchmark kind of came from. Yep. Um, so you know, absolutely, we've seen an uptick in the in the benchmark um, as inflation's kicked up, but we're also seeing an uptick in in the returns of the companies. And as I said earlier, they're positively correlated to inflation. So I'm not nervous about you know inflation and the benchmark from from that perspective, but you know I do worry about inflation because. Uh, you know, we've got we've got some pandemic inflation, which is going to take some time to work out. Our view is it's not all transitory. There is a structural component. You know, that probably works begins to work its way out by the by the middle of this decade. But we're going to have climate inflation coming through. So we're going to have higher fossil fuel energy costs. We're going to have higher utility bills because of the amount of money that we need to spend not just on building renewable generation, but also on our electricity grids. Um, and, and that is going to result in higher utility bills, which is going to result in higher inflation. Um, if you add into that, you know, our guess is we're going to start to see some carbon pricing likely coming in the middle of this decade and, mm. and you know, running out over time as well. You are going to see structural climate inflation on top of our you know run of the mill business cycle inflation as well, and and that's going to result in higher bond yields. Um, and let's be clear, you know the, the current forecast from Irena, which is the the, the global uh, renewable energy agency, you know, is that this decade across the energy spectrum we need to invest about sixty trillion dollars on a global basis. That's trillion with a T. They also expect that 78% of that will be debt funded. And, and excuse my language, but that is a hell of a lot of debt to bring to market over the next decade or so. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to see, we're quite likely to see higher bond yields. We're quite likely to see higher inflation. Uh, and, and that's going to be a real conundrum for both central banks and for, for governments. And all that You're incredibly policies. smart, man. Nick, I 100% agree with what you're saying. Drew and, I mean, been, yeah. Drew and I have been debating inflation all week. So, and he's nearly, got me, he's nearly got me convinced there is no threat. Of I think I had you last night, but yeah. uh, we'll, we'll keep that one going. <laughs> and so, the, I mean, you're saying there's a massive spend coming. Is infrastructure a way to protect 
you know, your own purchasing power in that. So the way I kind of understand is that, you know, if you're going to invest in the grid, you're not going to get a new group that doesn't exist today to fix the grid. You're going to get the incumbents and their their capital go up, their, their returns go up. Is that too simple or? No, that's that's absolutely correct. So, so what we are seeing, you know, over the last decade is uh, we've seen the growth in the underlying asset base of the companies go from kind of three to four percent per annum to now pushing up to eight to nine percent per annum and you know most of these companies are filing but you know anywhere from five year to to 25 year capital expenditure plans with their Mm -hmm. regulators every every year or two and so you know we're seeing an uptick in in future spending and right now you know it's about renewable energy it's about actually building gas fired plant because the batteries aren't there yet um, and and spending on the grids if we roll forward another five to ten years it's going to be spending on you know green hydrogen it'll be spending on batteries and they'll be closing down some of that gas fired plant you know we have got a 15 to 20 year runway of expenditure required to, to decarbonise our economies and, and mitigate climate change. And so that is going to drive, you know, growth in the asset base over that, that time frame um, and steady, you know, attractive returns to, to investors over that same time frame. Now, I've been looking at both your value. So you've got a value and an income approach to infrastructure. Correct. Can you explain the, the difference between those two, maybe with some reference to resilience in the last couple of years I've, yeah i haven't looked how resilient it was so <laughs> i'm finding out if it is yeah so so listen the, you know the value strategy uh, which is you know where we started the product we started with says okay we're looking for you know a, a reasonable balance between growth and and capital gain over over rolling five-year periods and and there we're targeting you know uh, income in the order of three to five percent and, and we're targeting, you know, growth in the order of, of you know, 5 to 8%. So, you know, something in the low double-digit return uh, range. Um, but looking for, you know, a, a reasonable balance uh, between, between that capital growth and, and the income. The income strategy, and, and listen, there's about a 50% crossover in terms of names and, and valuation, but the income strategy says, you know what, I'm willing to give up some of that future capital growth, some of the G, to get more I, more income. And so what happens is it generally tilts a little more towards the utilities. Uh, yeah, okay. and it tilts away from the more growthy infrastructure names. Um, and so the theory is, you know, as, as, we, as we grow over time, you know, the value strategy um, should have a bit more growth and all the rest of it. Actually, the experience is over the last decade with, you know, bond yield steadily moving down, and growth rates and utilities steadily moving up, yeah. actually the income strategy has done a lot better. And the income strategy strategy has higher income mm. and it's got better capital protection in, mm. in terms of the, the um, unit price of the, uh, of the fund. So, you know, during the GFC, it didn't fall as much. Value fell further because it had more, you know, airports and rail companies and things like that. Yep. Value recovered more quickly um, than in, than than the uh, than the the income strategy did. And, Tell me, go, so when we talk about infrastructure, um, we we typically uh, think about developed markets, um, but in terms of need, there must be a huge need in emerging markets. Um, is that is that easier to find opportunities in emerging markets as they are putting the infrastructure in, or can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, but listen, there's, there's a lot of opportunities. I, I, I characterise it like this. So in the developed markets, we are refurbishing a lot of the infrastructure that we have, or maybe we're closing coal plant, building more renewables. Yep. In the, in the emerging markets, because their growth is so high, we're actually building a lot of new infrastructure. Oh, okay. And so you know, we generally characterise the new infrastructure as higher risk than refurbishing or rebuilding, you know, the older infrastructure in, in the developed market. So, you know, yes, we have exposure to emerging markets. Uh, we tend to have, you know, higher growth, higher inflation markets where we, we've got a reasonable confidence in, you know, the sovereign risk, the, the legal and the regulatory risk and the contracting risk, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the market itself. 
Um, and you know, for each of the funds, we'll generally have anywhere up to about 20% exposure to, to emerging markets. At the moment, that's quite low, uh, as, in, as in we're sitting around you know, 5 to 10% exposure. And the reason for that is uh, we have you know, great opportunities in the developed markets that are producing fabulous returns for you know, a lower yeah, sure. risk profile. You don't have to go there. Um, so, so that would be kind of greenfield assets. You have to build from scratch. You'd if you had a growth fund, you don't. You'd imagine that would be the, you know, 100% kind of growth element where the traffic increases and the rail increases and the transport increases at a much rapid rate, and you would get. And there, there's some yeah. in the past things have gone wrong in infrastructure. Maybe probably more so during the GFC and before we've been invested in this distressed debt strategy where they've actually pulling a couple of toll roads, you know, out of the market. Is that, um, what can, can, do you see things going wrong again in, in infrastructure? Is it less likely in public markets because it's so transparent? It's listen, it's less likely in public markets. Um, and one of the reasons it's less likely is because we do have a lot less of that greenfield new build infrastructure. You know, yeah. you've really got to think of that as as private equity or venture capital. But that's because, a structure problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's a structure problem. You know, like Bruce yeah. Connect was structure, it wasn't. Yeah. 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 Bruce yeah. Connect, yeah. Uh, Bruce Connect, Connect East. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple yeah. of toll roads where the government promised to build connections that never <laughs> never turned up. Yeah. Seems and, whether it's pulled public private markets, not public markets. And then yeah. you've always and, got access to capital, don't you, in public markets, which is the Correct, correct. And most, listen, most of the, uh, all of our companies are incumbents in their space. And, you know, generally to the extent they're doing what they call, you know, growth capital expenditure, it might be, you know, building an adjunct to their existing grid. So extending their grid into, you know, into a neighbouring area. Um, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not kind of greenfield, it's what we've termed brownfield expansion, pretty low risk stuff. I heard Sir Rod Eddington talk about the role of government in infrastructure a few years ago. Um, and do you kind of have that uh, view that the government needs to participate pay a, a lot in this greenfield infrastructure space before they you know, turn it over to more commercial owners? So there's, there's two schools of thought on that. Um, one is that you know, government should kind of set public policy and then, and then allow the market to kind of work their way around it. Um, and, and, you know, there'll be, there'll be some things that are mistaken, but it's not the government losing money. It's, it's, it's kind of the private sector. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a, dare I say, free market capitalist, I, I have a lot of sympathy for, uh, for, that, for that position. Yep. The government's got to be clear on, on you know, what sure. the goals are and what the incentives are and, and, and you know, and just allow the market to then, to then do their thing. Um, you know, which we haven't really done on, on the whole climate change and, and energy. So let's put that, put that aside. The second school of thought is really uh, what I term the China approach. And, and in China, the, the, the approach is build it and they will come. Mm. And so a lot of their infrastructure investments happens at a state government level. Uh, and, they'll, and they'll use, you know, private sector contractors and things like that, but the sure. state government's backing it. They will build a toll road to a new industrial park. And after a few years, you know, once, once that, that road um, can tolerate, you know, tolls, they'll ramp up the tolls and they'll sell it into the listed market um, or to some other player. And then they'll recycle that capital into the next project. Hmm. Works really well where you've got a planned economy. Yeah. Yep. Right? Not so well where you know you've got a, a more market-based economy. So uh, you know, all due respect to, to Rod, there are certain areas where that where that works. Where you know you as a government say, "Hey, we are going to do this. It's uneconomic at the moment, yep. but you know we're going to get the ball rolling and get it kick started." Works really well in that context. Um, in a in a you know more general sort of approach, allocation of capital is generally better done by the private market than it is by, uh, you know, the politicians. And governments struggle to plan more than three, you know, what's the election cycle? Three and a half years. Yeah. So yeah. How long's the soundbite? Yeah. The, the, uh, 
in China, they wanted to build like shipbuilding yards in a certain area. So they built a city where people could live first rather than what tends to happen here is you just ship people in from somewhere else around the country to a certain area to build. It's kind of that, um, mm. that idea. Uh, in terms of renewables and are renewables becoming a part of your uh, portfolio? Yeah. Or... How do you turn concrete green? <laughs> I was going to say ESG, but we, you know, we our some our view is that most people listening to this don't don't really care about ESG. They just want you to do good things with with the money that you're investing. So, not bad things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, totally understand. Uh, so, renewables is a big part of our portfolio, uh, and and we made, you know, we we've been invested in in renewable companies, Kong Solar and and wind companies for you know well over a decade. Um, in 2019, we did a big piece of work internally, which looked at kind of the longer term picture, you know, should we get serious about decarbonising economies? And, and you know, it was obviously post um, Paris, Paris climate change and so on, uh, but we were starting to see some of these big, um, agencies like the International Energy Agency and the like start to come out with their, their views on, okay, how could we decarbonise over time? And, and so we completed a piece of work which basically said, listen, every year for the last decade, the market has underestimated how much money we need to spend on renewables and how much money was going to be spent on renewables. Yeah. Uh, separate issue, they might have overestimated the return profile of that, but that's you know, a separate issue. Uh, so what we started doing was buying the renewable companies and selling the uh, pipeline, so the you know the, the gas pipeline companies in particular. Uh, and, and you know, benefit of hindsight, timing worked out really good. Uh, Q4 of 19, Q1 of, of 2020, because through 2020, post pandemic, you know the renewables really took off. Mm. Uh, and and listen, this is a risk return scenario. We like to have them in the portfolio, but Towards the end of last year, they started getting really expensive. And, you know, I said our valuations are pretty stable. They went through those valuations. So we're like, okay, we're going to start selling them. And, and we sold, sold you know, a lot of our renewable stake. And, and, of course, they pulled back through the course of this year. We started buying them again last quarter. Um, uh, as, and as we've led into COP26, obviously, this has become a big issue in markets again. And, and those valuations are, um, are ticking back up. So, listen clearly needs to be part of any any infrastructure portfolio uh, you need to look at them on a on a case by case basis and you need to have a view as to where their projects are you know what are, what are, what's underpinning the returns uh, are they going to be able to you know achieve a long term return on those on those assets uh, and and are they contracted or are they exposed to market risk and we obviously prefer the contracted ones because you know, we want to be able to forecast the, the income and the dividends coming through from those companies so we can pay that out to our unit holders. That was the ETF-induced kind of bubble, wasn't it, where a couple of big ETFs were launched with small companies, I think it was New Zealand, renewable companies that went, went up five times in a short period of time. So listen, there is, a, there is a great play here for alpha in your portfolio <laughs> because what happens is, you know, these guys um, get rated by ESG rating houses and, you know, if you're talking to the companies and you're saying, oh, you've got this project in your, in your five-year plan, you know, what's going to happen to your ESG ratings when you do that project? They're like, oh, you won't believe it. You know, the ratings, we, we've already indicated the ratings are going to tick up by a couple of points. And, and we know that there is a huge amount of capital that is allocated based on those ratings. And so if you can get ahead of that game, then you can put, and we term them improvers, into your portfolio uh, where you know as they execute on those projects, the ratings are going to increase, gives them access to a whole bunch more um, capital and shareholders who will come in and buy the stock. Uh, share price goes up, cost of capital comes down, and and you know, we're making money through that process. You get the relentless bid, don't they? Yes. Yeah, surf, surf the green wave. So um, so uh, yep. If you're if you're you know, Mike Green fan, there'll be yeah the relentless bid the the. <laughs> Not the, just the, green, everything. The, the, yeah, the, everything. The, the passive taking over the world. I totally agree. And how did uh, I kind of mentioned it before? How did the, I know over one year income was never going to be pretty? You know, it's it's infrastructure, it's people movement. How did how's income kind of been resilient over the last three or four? 
four years. Yeah, well, if you, I mean, if you look at the income strategy, um, you know, it's after fees returned about 15% annualised over the last three years, um, which is stellar. Please don't, you know, take that as what we'll do going forward. Um, but if you look at the at the income that we've generated out of that, um, in in um, FY19, um, we paid out um, 6.35 um, cents per unit. Uh, in FY20, we paid out 7.2. And FY21, we paid out 13.75. Now, yeah, in, in there is true income coming through from the underlying companies and, and some trading profits um, yep. that we make as well of trust structures that gets paid out. So it didn't really uh, so, drop during during the sell-off. Or when, no, not the sell-off, when everyone cut cut their dividends or all, all the... Well, you know, interestingly, you take the income strategy, uh, you know, we got at a portfolio level... Uh, we got more than we expected through that time. So we had, yes, we had airports in particular um, cutting their dividends and a, and a few of the toll roads, um, but that is that that strategy is is utility heavy. And actually, we had a number of the utilities who were increasing their payouts, yeah. um, and part of that was because you know everybody working at home, their their commercial loads went down, but their residential loads went up. They make more money on the residential. <laughs> And, and so, you know, they paid out higher dividends. Um, so, so it was, you know, somewhat self-correcting there. Uh, and, and, you know, we've been able to manage that, that divvy profile pretty nicely um, over the last few years. And how do, how do valuations look, say, now compared to five years ago or even 15 years ago? Is it still, say, multiple of earnings? You, you, would be, you would be staggered. The, the earnings multiples have been steady for about the last eight years, um, you know, we sit between. We look at these on a, on a um, you know, cash cash earnings, so EBITDA, to to total enterprise value, which is equity and, and debt altogether, uh, and that's been sitting between ten and twelve times um, for the last eight years. Even as your cost of capital has been coming down, mm. and and the growth profile has been increasing. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we're at a point now where. These things are a pretty attractive value. They're one of the only areas in the market that, you know, hasn't kind of ripped away. Uh, and, and, you know, we're looking at very solid asset-based growth, which we know is going to lead through to growth in earnings, growth in cash flows, and growth in dividends. We thought we would talk about a couple of stocks, Drew. Do you want to turn yeah. to that? I was going to, um, yeah, I was going to do the, the kind of, oddball or the you know, out of nowhere question, which is if you could only own one asset, doesn't have to be a stock, could be one of the underlying assets in your portfolio for 20 years, what would it be? We, we do this with the stock guys, right? So yeah. you've got to pick one asset, you're retired at 60, you, you you only can have one for whatever amount of money you have in retirement. Not easy. What, <laughs> what asset? You can't invest in your fund. It's got to be one asset. What, what yeah. one is it? Nick? Well, uh, I'd be happy to own just about any of the um, U.S. utilities. Um, you know, pick, pick. We've got Exelon on the fund. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, be happy to own that. Uh, I would also be happy to own um, Getlink in the portfolio. Getlink owns Eurotunnel, uh, nice. which obviously is the tunnel between you know nice. UK and UK and France. Nice. Uh, that has that is a great green asset because. Europe is trying to push people off short haul travel on yep. airplanes mm. onto onto rail, and so we'll oh, see right. you know, more and more rail. It's a bit depressed at the moment because you know there's a trade argument between the UK and Europe. That's going to get itself sorted out. It might take a year or two, but that's one where you know you've got a very long dated asset, another eighty odd years to run. Uh, you've got uh, you know the green um, tinge on it. And you've actually got a few big cornerstone shareholders that you know one day uh, might might take the asset out. So uh, when you start talking about carbon, if carbon gets priced and starting to get priced in airfares, but it will, then the cost of flying over the channel versus under the channel on a train must be substantially different. Yeah, if you if you take one gallon of fuel mm. and you're trying to move one ton of freight. Right on an airplane, you can move that about four and a half miles. Okay. On a, on a truck, you can get 130 miles, and yep. and on a train, you can get about 485 miles. Mm. And so, so you know, right. when you look at trains versus versus air, there's just no comparison. 
Mm. I use that stat. I'm going <laughs> to write that one down. And maybe just uh, that one, maybe I'll have a look, look at one stock before we finish up. So Exelon, was that so US? Yeah, it's a, it's a big US utility. Uh, it has a, a monster uh, nuclear powered fleet uh, of, of generation. And so, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know. People have different views on, uh, on totally. nuclear. Uh, but when you're talking about you know decarbonizing economies, uh, you have to nuclear has to be part of uh, the discussion, and not for all countries. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be tough to to get that up in in Australia, for example. Um, but in the US, it already has a significant nuclear fleet. It's a it's a no brainer to to continue to run those companies, and so you know we see great support for the uh, for the the nuclear side of their business, and you know it's interesting in the in the latest. Uh, build back better plan that, that Biden's trying to get through. There will be support for uh, for the nuclear energy there. Um, uh, also inside that business, they've got some great um, distribution utility businesses that are growing at, at a, above average rates, right? And so you know they're the guys that are they're building electric vehicle charging stations. They're mm-hmm. starting to get their grid ready for you know electricity actually to flow. You know. Um, both ways rather than just flow in, in one direction. Um, they've got some great um, transmission assets. So that's the high voltage wires that, that cross over state borders. And Princeton University published a study, it's about a year ago now, suggesting that in the US, they need to increase the, uh, the size in terms of number of miles of that high voltage transmission lines by 60% mm. this decade in order to be able to meet the net zero by 2050 target. And the reason is you're putting in a lot of renewable energy, you're putting that in in places where it's, you know, the sun shines or the wind blows, not necessarily where the, where the population centres are, and you've got to be able to move that energy around uh, around the, the, the country and connect all of these population centres and, and generation um, centres. So that transmission network, it's going to be the same here in Australia, is going to have a huge amount of growth associated with it. It's one of the reasons that that Osnet, you know, big yep. transmission business and Spark Infrastructure, big transmission business, Transgrid, you know, are uh, are in the sights of the of the um, the, the uh, public to privates. I think it's a good kind of insight that you don't have to be, you know, there's a lot of momentum and popular themes, but you can actually access those themes in a kind of more defensive or or conservative way that makes it, sense through. Yeah, it's no, it's a it's a really good point because you know you 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 want to be investing with public policy, mm. but you want to have confidence in the returns that you're going to earn on your investment as well. And and Absolutely. in the US, the transmission sector is federally regulated mm-hmm. and the feds are providing you know low double digit returns, anywhere from 10 to 12 percent on the equity in the underlying asset, but but here's the key: they assume that the asset is funded 60% equity, 40% debt, and so you're carrying very low financial risk, sure. and you're getting great returns, you know, from a from a sector that's that's going to grow um, significantly over the next decade. Mm. Well, Nick, we might leave it there. Uh, fascinating talking to you and uh, we see infrastructure playing a big role in our clients retirement portfolios but really appreciate you giving up your time and just spending it with Drew and I and explaining some of the basics around uh, infrastructure and where your fund fits within portfolios so appreciate it Nick. My pleasure thanks gents. Yeah thanks Drew thanks Nick.